Hey, everybody, how's it going? <laughs> it's good to be here. Um, I see we've already got some uh, questions getting started. I've also got a few that were pre-submitted from Project 24 members, a couple from YouTube and from Income School Insights. So I'm going to go ahead and jump in. Um, today, I have a feeling the majority of the discussion is going to be around blogging, Google, kind of future of SEO for blogging. Um, and also just traffic. Where's that come from? What does that what the business model look like and all that? So we, we can go into all that, but also feel free to bring what other, whatever other questions you have to the table. I am going to start with a couple of questions here that came from Project 24 members. So this first one um, says that I mentioned in a recent Doug Cunnington podcast that from the very beginning, I would focus on foundational content um, rather than just kind of the methods that we've taught historically in the blogging system. So, you know, what we've taught before was kind of like your first 10 blog posts, write response posts, kind of find those using industry terminology, finding kind of long tail keywords, easy to rank because low competition kind of stuff, um, fairly short blog posts. And that's not terrible because a lot of times it just takes, um, that kind of practice to kind of get good at finding a question people have and answering that question thoroughly in a blog post. That said, from the very beginning, I think I would focus on what I called in there kind of foundational content. And so the question here is, what's foundational content? Does it look like 10 or so response posts that are answering specific questions um, in each kind of subcategory for the website so that we're, we have like a, a lot of content? Or does it look like long staple posts um, kind of like what we used to call pillar posts for each subcategory and then kind of building on as we go. And where would we find this foundational content? So that's the kind of the big question. Now, here's what I think about that. When I say foundational content, I'm talking about just the important information for your industry. Whatever my topic is for my website, there, I mean, we're going to break that down, the main topic, into categories and subcategories just because we, we need to be organized and we want to make sure that we're not just all over the place. But for any kind of category within my within the, my overall topic, there are going to be certain questions that basically everybody has and, those, and that they're going to search a ton. And some of those are going to be very competitive because really big websites in your industry already have content answering those questions. Answer those questions. Now, if it takes the form of longer blog posts or if it takes the form of several smaller ones, that honestly isn't what's key here. What's key here is making sure that we have it. You can't really establish topical authority in a topic if you haven't answered the biggest questions in that topic. So, you know, rather than just focusing on low competition search queries, we're going to make sure that we're including very foundational, um, just the, the big questions that people have or the common questions that people have. Um, and that way we have a mix of those. We also want some of the low competition stuff because it'll be a lot easier to rank for those. The next question here from a Project 24 member, and I promise I only have a few here and then we're coming right to you guys that are here live. Um, so that's great. Um, but here says, how can a busy YouTube content creator build a lower effort blog to gain traffic to their channel and promote an info product? Is there a way to do it with a lighter amount of work than a full-time blogger? And if so, where would I start? I think this is a great question. And it really kind of goes back to what we did when we started our Backfire YouTube channel. So um, four, five years ago, we started a YouTube channel. Um, and Really, it was kind of an experiment. We were testing out our theories about YouTube so that we could teach YouTube in our in our YouTube system as part of Project 24. And uh, we made a bunch of content, and then we took a few months off while we focused on other things. Um, we hired new people. We had, I mean, there's just a lot of work going on. And then we're like, ah, well, you know what? That's actually doing pretty well. Let's uh, let's make some more content. And we would kind of go in spurts. Like we were not doing it the way that you ideally would for, for YouTube. And yet, over the course of a couple of years, it grew to be decently substantial. I mean, um, I guess three years ago, almost three years ago, um, 
when Jim, my former partner, when he left and he took backfire with him, we were just shy of a hundred thousand subscribers. Now it's way over that. It's over 700,000, I think, um, because he's taken that as kind of his full-time thing over the last three years, which is fantastic. Uh, but what's cool about this is we started the blog and there are a few things that we did because we didn't have time to write a ton of really good content. We, it's also not a topic that we entrusted to just generic writers. Um, and so here's what we did. One, we wrote a little bit of content ourselves. Um, that was a project that Jim Moore worked on, but he wrote a handful of really solid resource blog posts. So the, the topic was around shooting sports. Um, whether or not you agree with that, it's immaterial here. But um, he wrote like a blog post about, we had put together this huge chart with a ton of data for all different cartridges, different sizes of, um, of bullets that you can shoot. And um, we had a ton of ballistics data. And one of the things that we had was the amount of energy they use and stuff in order to calculate sort of a measurement of recoil. So how much the gun recoils. And um, we put that together in, we just had this huge database, right? So we made a blog post or he wrote this blog post all about recoil, put in it this big table with just like, just data. So you could just compare side by side a whole bunch of different cartridges. And I mean, that can rank for literally hundreds of search queries. And it, it did. But here's what was cool about that was because we already were on YouTube and we were already building an audience there, anytime that we referred to anything that had to do with recoil, we would tell people about this resource that we had on the website. We could just briefly mention it, link to it. And that gave us instant traffic to that blog post and instant authority. Um, Google sees that traffic. They see that people clicked over from YouTube. So it's referral traffic. And instantly that blog post started ranking very quickly for a lot of different search queries around recoil. Creating those really good resource posts means like one of those can take the place of probably dozens of individual little blog posts. The other thing we did was we invited people who were knowledgeable on the topic, people who read content on the website, people who watched the YouTube channel. Um, just every now and then we would mention, hey, if you want to write, for us, you can, you can write on our website. And so we had a handful of people who were writing for us freelance who weren't like, they weren't bloggers, they were knowledgeable in the topic. And it's way easier to get really good content on people who have knowledge of the topic than it is to get really good content from people who are knowledgeable about writing, but not the topic. And we've been really successful with that. We initially did that with our Camper Report website. Some of the best content we got, um, short of what we wrote ourselves, was content that we got from freelancers who were people who used and lived in RVs. So that can be a great way to reduce the amount of time, but also you just aren't going to have to write as much or do as much work with your blog because you're already establishing a lot of credibility with YouTube videos. So, and there's, there are a lot of other different things we could do to kind of help make use of content we've already made for YouTube kind of make use of that as a blog. I wouldn't use AI to just like write a transcript or rework a transcript, but you could take information from a video, take the transcript, feed it into the AI and guide it to write a good blog post based on using as a source material what you said in a video. I think that could work. Um, but video content and blog content are so different that when we try to just take, if you try to take a blog post and use it as a script for a YouTube video, it doesn't look, it doesn't, it just doesn't, isn't very good. Likewise, if you take a transcript of a YouTube video and just try to make it a blog post, it doesn't read very well. It's a different media. So um, last one I have here from Project 24 members says, um, he says, he, he acknowledges nobody knows the answer to this, but in my opinion, how much weight has selling a product had on EEAT of a website? So one of the big theories out there is if you sell your own products on your website, then you're more likely to be viewed as authoritative by Google. Now, the caveat here is that most of us that sell products don't actually do it on our own website. A lot of the products we sell are hosted on third party. If you're using Shopify, um, I mean, if you're using like WooCommerce or SureCart, then you're selling it right on your website. 
but a lot of people who have a store are actually selling on a different platform altogether. Um, but they still get the benefit of this. So here's what I think is that one of the things that Google is trying to do is verify our legitimacy. Uh, it's hard for independent bloggers if they don't have a very big social presence on the web. It's, it's hard to verify that they are who they say they are and that their content is accurate, even if you put a ton of work into it and really know. I mean, anybody can say they're a doctor. So uh, we need a lot of these other signals. And one really good signal Google can use is, do you have a Google business listing? Even if you don't have a pin on the map because you don't have an office that people can come to, having a Google business listing and um, along with that, oftentimes having products to sell where people who have bought the product then leave you reviews. And so like for us, I don't like people can leave reviews for me on income school. They right now they're not set up to publish automatically. So I'm way behind their reviews that I haven't gone through and like put in the right format to post. Um, so that's, that's on me, but we do also have a Google business listing for income school. And I invited members like, a while ago, year and a half, two years ago, I just said, hey, it would be helpful to us if you want to leave a review for us, positive or negative, we're not gonna take them down, but um, go leave a review for us on Google if you don't mind. And they did. And we said, and we actually just said, there's a few different places you can leave listings for us. One, Google. Another one, I was approached a couple, three years ago by the Better Business Bureau. And they said, we think that you should be listed with the Better Business Bureau and get a rating and start getting um, feedback through uh, people's reviews. And so I did. And so I have to pay a little bit every single month to <laughs> keep my listing there with the Better Business Bureau. But that's a place where people can go and look and see if other consumers have complained about me. Got my first complaint yesterday, by the way. It's completely ludicrous. But um, I responded to it and it'll be fine. <laughs> but um, uh, people can leave reviews there too. And so I just have a spot on the website where I just say, hey, if you want to leave a review, here's a few places you can do it. You can leave it here for our website. Go put it on Google. Go put it on Desert Business Bureau. Some people put it in all places. Um, I even listed uh, another website. Um, I'll shout out eBizFacts. They do reviews of affiliate courses. We don't rank very well because I don't, have, I don't ever do a strong push to send people over there. So I have way fewer ratings over there than anywhere else. But I have actual reviews on the internet about a product I sell. Google knows income school is a legitimate business because other people have experienced having doing business with us. And anything you can do, whether that's just literally selling an ebook under the name of your business, even if you're selling it on Amazon, I think it's going to make a difference because people are going to be able to buy the book. They're going to be able to see you as an author. You can, you know, link that to your website. There's so many signals going on there that just help to validate your existence and your legitimacy. So, and I do think that that's made a difference. Um, the more signals we can have externally, and I mean, you could just say, well, yeah, that's backlinks. But I think there's a, it's not just backlinks. And backlinks are good. But having the right kind of links and the right kind of signals, my Google listing only has really one link to my website. It's the link that says, here's the website. But because it's connected, all of those reviews that have been written, Google can process those and see how they vote um, positively or negatively for the products I sell and therefore for my legitimacy. So things to keep in mind. Um, I'm going to check here because I also posted this for Income School Insiders. Got some likes over there, but no specific questions. I also got a few questions that were pre-submitted from my community post. So I'm going to address a couple of those and then we're going to you guys that are live. Um, so first one here says, do you feel that websites with quite a small niche can achieve good page views and income after 24 months if you start and work hard? Um, the size of the niche, I don't think is the issue. So people talk about niche sites and niche sites are dead. And honestly, I have mostly avoided the term niche site or niche site for few years now because I don't like the mentality around it. The mentality generally being, I'm going to pick a really specific topic. I'm going to write a bunch of content about that topic. Um, usually just focusing on um, 
long tail keywords. We're going to put some ads and affiliate on there and it's a passive income site and like, that's it. And we've been really trying to push people the direction of building something a little bit more impactful, something building a brand over a year ago, we made a video about branding. It didn't do that well because it's not a super popular topic with people in the niche site crowd. They're like, I don't want to build a brand. I just want to make this little thing and stay completely anonymous and have it be as passive as possible. And the result of that is what we're seeing today. Um, I think going that direction is, is a mistake, but having a specific topic, a niche, isn't the problem. You can have a very specific um, topic for your website. You can pick a niche and you can write the content for it and you can work really hard and you can build a brand, but we're going to have to work on building that credibility. And, and that's, that's, I think, what's missing for most niche site people is working on that credibility. Yes, there's a link building aspect for most people as well who are in the niche site space, but that's my problem with the term link building. It's not about the link. It's about the credibility. And so we participate in industry outreach, and we'll be talking more about that today. So is it possible even within 24 months? Absolutely. Uh, in a small niche, absolutely. You're probably not going to do it if over the course of two years, you've written about 50 blog posts and that's it. But if you're creating good content and you're doing your industry outreach, you're participating. And if you work on monetizing in ways that aren't just ads and um, affiliate marketing, then you can make substantially more income in 24 months. In fact, you can often make a substantial income from much lower traffic levels than what most passive income niche site people um, need to have in order to be able to make any sort of real money. So is it doable? Yes. Now, um, you, you just have to change that mindset a little bit. The Another part of that was how would you start a blog? They have a, about 200 videos on their YouTube channel. So how do you, what would you do to incorporate video and, and blogging? Um, you know, if your blogs are very kind of hands-on tutorial, um, fantastic. Like, if you're, if those are what your videos are, go ahead and make a blog post that supplements that list that lists out the steps of the tutorial, all the materials needed and all that kind of stuff. So they kind of go together. And that is a great complete resource for somebody who's got that question. If your videos are more just, you know, talking head, um, but not like not quite in the same format where it, a video is really needed to go along with the blog post. Well, then what I might do is just take some of that information and write, try to repackage it in a way that makes sense for blogging, kind of like we talked about earlier with the other YouTube question. Um, but, you know, video content is ranking really well right now. Um, YouTube or, you know, Google, who owns YouTube, loves to promote video content. Um, but also video content is ranking as it is posted on YouTube, but it's also ranking the page for a website. So sometimes you'll click on a video and it'll take you to the page. Um, on your website where that video is. So we'll take the videos that we've published on YouTube, we'll embed them on our website, oftentimes when there's a resource on the website that matches it. So if I have over 200 videos, I'm gonna look for those videos where a really good supplemental piece of content would, would be helpful for the video, and I'm gonna go create that piece of content and embed the video with it. That's probably where I would start. Um, one here about EEAT and YMYL. Uh, student, a student in nutrition that's not yet board certified. How do you handle YMYL? Um, they've been adding links to YouTube videos from experts, but doesn't that pull people off the website? I would not just add links to the videos. I would just embed them on your website. Um, that's totally fine to do. As long as if the video, if you click share and it can be embedded, then it, you can embed it on your website. There's no copyright issue there. Then people are watching it on your website. The creator of the video is getting credit for that view but they're staying on your website. So that's the way I would go about that. Um, but I would just focus on kind of building up that brand. Eventually you will be board certified, but having that certification is valuable for YMYL, but it's hard, you know, you have to like prove to Google that you have that. It's probably better to work on building up credibility, creating a brand, participating in your industry, once you are board certified, go work on getting yourself on some podcasts and collaborating with YouTubers and stuff. Um, 
because that's going to do a lot. Then people are going to be able to see you and see that, okay, this is a person who knows what they're talking about. They're claiming that they're board certified, um, but they're doing it like in videos and on podcasts and stuff. And people could go look you up and see that you actually are. Uh, those kinds of things are going to help more so than just having that certification. So for now, work on creating good content, work on building a bit of a brand, maybe start some of that industry outreach as much as you can. And then once you are board certified um, and you can say like, I'm a doctor, I'm a new, whatever your certification is, then you'll be in a really good position uh, to go out more, much more publicly uh, because people will be able to look you up and see that you have that certification. Another one I got pre-submitted. Um, this is just kind of overview. Um, what do we do going forward with blogging? Uh, without focusing too much on the Google SERPs, what opportunities do we see? Um, they say there, Marcus says, trying to diversify traffic sources. Are there opportunities for creating new niche blogs? We already kind of talked about that, um, new niche blogs. Diversifying traffic sources, I think, is really valuable. Um, if we don't want to be dependent on Google and other search engines, or, I mean, people say, well, why don't we just focus on, like, being in DuckDuckGo and stuff? Well, that's great. We already are. The way we create content ranks really well on those other <laughs> search engines. We're not just creating content specifically for Google. We found that when we do work that makes our content rank well on Google, it ranks really well everywhere else too. But the majority of internet users aren't using those other search engines. They're mostly using Google. So when it comes to search traffic, we just want to make sure that we know what's going on with Google. It's not that we're big fans or anything like that. But we can diversify our traffic sources. If you're in a niche that does decently well on Pinterest, make sure you're on Pinterest. We added a course in Project 24 on Pinterest that one of our members, Kara, she put together for us. And as part of the course, she literally built a Pinterest account for Cook for Folks and just started creating the pins and implementing her strategy and showing what she, how she did it as she went along. We just got the four month update and we're, I mean, just, hitting great numbers. We're seeing awesome growth, a little bit of a hockey stick there in the last few weeks. Um, great timing for the niche as well as we head toward the summer, but also um, basically following exactly the pattern that she sees every time. It's pretty repeatable. Pinterest is a much easier search engine to sort of game <laughs> than, um, than Google is, but it's not really a whole lot of gaming required. It's just knowing how to create the right kind of pins. Um, and we don't even go crazy. Like she's not even creating tons and tons of pins. So um, anyway, that's that's done pretty well and it's diversifying traffic. In fact, Cook for Folks is our site that there's this last update, there's no, there's nothing. There's no blip. Um, so that's pretty cool. And I don't know how much of an impact Pinterest had. I need to go check if search console traffic dropped, but Pinterest went up and that's why we're not seeing much of a dip. Um, I don't think that that accounts for all of it. I think that that probably among other things has helped solidify cook for folks in the SERPs, even though um, it's not a big corporate site. Um, so yes, there are lots of opportunities to diversify traffic, um, not just like social media, like Facebook and Instagram, although just being present on other platforms is good, but I think it's important to understand where your ideal audience is, where are they hanging out online? If your ideal audience is on TikTok, well, then maybe that's where we should be. Um, if your ideal audience is on Rumble, make sure you're on Rumble. But if you're making videos for Rumble, you might as well publish them on YouTube as well. Um, so yeah, I just start with where your audience is and don't worry about being everywhere at first. Um, just create content for, for them where they are. Last pre-submitted question. Um, is it time to pivot to incorporate a stronger backlink strategy? Given the shift to Google seeming to favor larger, higher domain site rating sites, is this how smaller sites can perhaps rise in the SERPs? Um, and he says, I'm not specifically talking about link building, but but shifting our efforts toward things that would get us more backlinks. Um, also, follow up to that, what are the odds this will correct later? And if we just wait as the junk gets cleared out, will, will we just come back? I don't think that that's in really the strategy we want to take of just like, well, let's just wait because I think Google will sort things out later. I do think that where we're at right now is not the end state that Google wants. I think they're working on trying to get there. And right now it's oftentimes really hard to differentiate between good blog content and really bad blog content. And if we're honest, 
most of the blog content on the internet is not very good content. So a lot of it's being swept up together. I do think that over time, um, Google will improve their ability to sort between the two, but I can't, we can't just rely on making quality content. We also need to work really hard to build our brand and our credibility, which means shifting our focus or ensuring that we're including in our strategy plenty of external um, efforts that will give us backlinks. But again, it's participating in our industry. It's outreach. It's um, it's just making sure that it's clear to Google and to people that we're, we're actually the people that we say we are. We're legitimate. Um, we're a business. And that's one of the things that I think a lot of us need to shift our mindset on. I've been trying to sort of edge us this way for a long time, and I've been doing it far too subtly because I think a lot of viewers here don't realize that this is at all what I'm trying to do. But I don't want you to think of yourself as a blogger. I don't want you to think of yourself as a niche website builder. Like you have a business. Even if you're not selling anything yet and your whole business right now is just content, think of it as that. Think of it as a business and give yourself that level of credibility. And as you think of yourself that way and start acting more that way, you're going to do those things that give you credibility. So we'll talk about more of that as we go forward on the YouTube channel as well as in Project 24. Okay, Whew. lots of pre-submitted questions, but I'm here for you that are live. So let's jump into your questions now. And um, so the first one here was from Kevin. Um, I ranked a Medium post number one next day. Wrote another and again, I went to number one. Uh, there are rules but you can post affiliate links. So what are my thoughts about writing on other platforms like Medium? I have no issue with writing on other platforms. I just also want to make sure that most of my emphasis is building out what I own. Um, but Medium can be a great place to go put some content and build credibility for yourself. So just, again, continue to use that same, that same brand, that same name. You know, if I'm writing... Um, you know, as Ricky Kessler on Income School, and I go write a blog post on Medium that's on a blogging related topic, and you know, I'm going to use my name, Ricky Kessler. I'm going to refer to the other work that I do um, with it and and show that credibility. But also that way, any readers are likely to, you know, they, they're going to want to go see the other stuff that I've done. But also it's going to give a lot more credibility to my site. So like, if I just post on Medium and just, you know, I put affiliate links in and stuff, so I make some money there, it's still going to be really limiting as to, I mean, at some point, you, maybe you have enough credibility that you're like, well, I could probably sell an info product, but but where? Do you just finally build a website then? So even if you're not going to write a ton of content on your own website, I would create your own website. So you have a landing page, you have um, just a place to send people and to link to from a Google listing and, and all that stuff. So just, just have your own property <laughs> online um, and make sure that you build that out. And the same would go for someone who's like a YouTuber. I would say, um, you know, get a website, <laughs> build a website um, and have a place where you can send people that shows that I'm not just someone who makes videos. Um, I, I'm a person, I'm an entity, I'm a brand that you can interact with and that has other offerings and stuff. And I think that's going to do a lot to um, build credibility. All right. Um, there are a lot, of, some of these questions are, are things we've kind of touched on. Like I want to start a blog this year. Um, how do I start? I see lots of videos. Um, I find it hard daily to stay relevant with my job. Um, so, you know, getting started, it, it really comes down to start by figuring out what it is that you want to create. What do you want to offer to the world? So we would tell people before, like, pick a niche. But then people would say, well, what's the best niche? And I say, well, I don't know. What are you interested in? <laughs> um, what's something that you know more than other people about or something that you um, are so interested in that you feel confident that you could really, like, build on that topic for a good period of time? Um, and where you could come up with something, even if you don't have it today, but come up with something that adds value to that, that industry. Um, 
that's your niche. I don't really care what it is. I don't really care how competitive it is. There's a dentist on every corner just about here. And every one of them has a lot of patience because everybody needs a dentist, right? Well, the same is true with online business. I know it seems like, well, but everybody can read the same blog. It's not like a dentist. A dentist can't, one dentist can't serve everyone. That's true. But a lot of people aren't going to connect with one blog. And a lot of people are going to have different questions based on their needs and their experience that aren't going to be answered by that one blog post. They're going to ask different questions and have different concerns. And I keep finding today, even though content has just blown up on the internet because of AI, I still keep finding all sorts of search queries that I'm searching that do not have a good answer. Now, part of that might be because there were good answers in blog posts and Google now is not showing them anymore because they can't tell if they're any good. But this has always been the case. We're always running into, and even a year or two, five years ago, we're always running into search queries that we can't find good answers for because nobody's created something that solves that specific problem. We find it all the time. So find a way that you can add value to the world and then choose that as your topic. And then typically for us, we're just going to, at that point, go the route of creating a website on WordPress, very simple, and start writing content. And from there, we can figure the rest out. Now, because we're saying, like, you need to think of yourself as a business and, and stuff, I, there have been some questions around, okay, well, do I need to start with my product and then create content? And you can. If you have a product in mind, if there's something you're like, oh, there's something I'd really love to sell, or you're already a business, you already sell things, and you're like, oh, I just want to increase my traffic and get more credibility and notoriety and get more traffic organically because I'm so tired of paying for so much ad space. If that's the case, like, that's fine if you started with a product. That's great. That puts you ahead, okay? Because now you can make sure that you're crafting content that will actually funnel people to your product. So that's that's fantastic. But if you don't have that yet, that's okay. Start with the areas of your topic that you find really interesting, really valuable. Create their, your content around that. Just But just don't have the mindset of this is going to be an easy way to make lots of money super passively. That's, that's just not how it's going to work. Okay. Um, I got a question here. Digital Catalog Hub. Are affiliate sites doomed? If all you are is an affiliate site, chances are this is going to be a tough road going forward. If all you do is... Um, write reviews of products, um, compare products. It's going to be tough unless you are like the tester of products. So Wirecutter did a fantastic job of this. They tested products. Now they're owned by New York Times um, and they don't do as good a job anymore. But um, they built that credibility because they actually tested products. I think YouTubers who test products I think can still do really well, but most affiliate sites, if we're honest, are content where people just create a lot of pros and cons table or comparisons tables of products. Many times products they've never even touched. It's just based off Amazon reviews. People don't need that anymore, especially because I can go straight to Amazon and I can literally watch videos from people who are influencers who are holding the product and will tell me about their experience with the product why would I go read somebody's blog post where I have no evidence that they've even touched the product? And I think Google, part of the reason that a lot of people who say, well, having affiliate links gets you, um, gets you deranked on Google. I don't think having affiliate links does that. It hasn't for me, but if that is the emphasis and focus of your website, then you probably don't have the kind of content that should be ranked, honestly. Um, because people might as well just go straight to Amazon and watch the videos there and read the actual reviews, especially because now Amazon will also has little um, AI review sections that will just summarize the reviews. Like these are the things people really liked about the product. These are the things they disliked. Well, a lot of Amazon reviewers, that was literally what you did. You would read all the Amazon reviews and you would summarize them in a blog post. That, that's gone. There's no reason to do that anymore. Um, I've been telling you not to do it for several years. Now, there's absolutely no reason to ever read that kind of blog post ever again. Um, all right. I'm struggling with my website speed on mobile. What are your recommendations? So um, I really only worry about site speed if it's like a noticeable problem for the user. 
I don't really worry that much about the core web vitals numbers. Um, some people are still really hung up on those. They turned out to basically be a non-issue when it comes to ranking. Um, they're barely a tiebreaker. Uh, so don't worry about them from that standpoint. If you load your website and it loads normal, like other websites do, then that's fine. Now, if it's loading really slow, then we got a problem. And there's usually a few things. Now you can go, you can use PageSpeed Insights, which is free or lots of other tools, just Google PageSpeed Insights and it's a tool from Google. And they will tell you, these are the things that are specifically slowing your site down. Um, and that is probably the best thing to do. Some of the most common issues are images. The image files are too big. So if your WordPress theme um, or just your site in general, the way that it's built, you're not using the plugins to do this and stuff. So it's serving like full size images, even when you're like on mobile, it's serving like a desktop size in terms of number of pixels. That's a problem. It should be able to recognize, oh, this is a mobile version. Let's go ahead and serve a smaller version of the image. Um, and it'll just have multiple versions. Um, Short Pixel is a plugin that will do that kind of stuff for you. Um, so just, just do that. That will help a lot. The other thing that often happens is if you have a lot of scripts that are running JavaScript and stuff, you can try to minify them with plugins like Autoptimize. Um, but also, you might just try to figure out, like, do I really need whatever it is that's, <laughs> that is running this script? It's, if it's some plugin or something and it's just doing some feature, some animation that you think is kind of cool, but it really doesn't add anything, like maybe decide whether or not it's worth it. Those are probably some of the main things is um, scripts that are running out of order or um, that are just unnecessary or too long and, uh, and images. If, you're, if it's not that, then you're going to need to dig into it and see what PageSpeed Insights tells you. Um, we got a question here. One of my old sites has seriously been affected by the latest update. It was poorly SEO'd and the focus was too broad. How or now can I niche it down to one category? Should I delete, should I delete the poor content then? You can niche it down to one category. That um, will probably help build topical authority in just a more specific area. Uh, it's easier to start specific and broaden your topic as you get more content, as you can create more content, and as you have authority in that space to cover kind of adjacent topics and grow your brand. It's a lot harder to start really broad because you have to fill in a ton of content from the very beginning. Deleting poor content, actually I would. So for the last couple of years with helpful content, Google's been saying, if you have content that they deem is unhelpful on your website, it will actually put like a little modifier onto your overall credibility score and it will harm the rest of your website. So if you have content that is poor content um, and that is just written for the algorithm, not really for people, and that violates kind of any of the recommendations from Google's helpful content, I would consider absolutely either removing it, whether that's just moving it to a draft but later and try to recreate that content in a much better way. Or just if you're just like, I'm never going to recreate that blog post, I don't care if you delete it. I would probably remove it from the index. Um, cool. Where can I find good writers for my blog? Honestly, the best writers, I think, nowadays for your blog are people who know your topic, independent of whether or not they are a writer, you know? So if you go to, you know, really anywhere, uh, Upwork, and find people that are blog writers, um, you know, they can craft a blog post that sounds like a good blog post, but if they don't know your topic, it's not really very helpful. We ran into that own that same problem with our own writers. That's why we stopped doing it, honestly. I would get contact back from them for my own site, and I'd be like, you know, I need to spend another two hours on this blog post anyway. I probably should have just written it from the beginning. It would have been a lot easier because I wouldn't have to correct a bunch of things they said that I don't even agree with. So at this point, I would find people that are in your industry, that know your industry, even if they're just kind of fans of your industry, but it's something that they live. Um, like I talked about earlier in this, like we did with Backfire and with Camper Report. That worked so well. And then it's just normal people who are going to like the idea of making a little bit of extra money on the side. What we usually did with those writers is I didn't expect them to write a blog post a day. 
it was more like based on their availability, anywhere from one to four a month. I I may have had a writer or two that did like two a week at some point. But for most of them, it was like a blog post a week or every other week. And so it'd be something they could just kind of work on here and there over a couple of weeks. They would often supply their own photos. So like on Camper Report, we literally got blog posts where people had pictures of a project they did in their own camper. And that was fantastic. And they wrote under their own name and we listed them as an author on the website. That's a great way to go. If you're just going to go with like a generic Upwork writer um, who doesn't know your topic very well, I'd rather get a first draft from AI, frankly, um, and then work rework it from there because I'm probably going to have to rework the article somebody else wrote if they don't know the topic very well. I might as well just use AI for the first draft. I'll probably end up with a better finished product um, because I can kind of mold what the AI is giving me and then and add my voice to it a little bit more um, and add my own stories and stuff in. And I could probably do that as fast as or faster than completely correcting something somebody else wrote um, and putting it into my voice, if that makes sense. So uh, that's where I'm at with that. Um, let's see. Next question here. Um, Improving your writing skills. So this is from Adrian de Coster. Um, besides writing more blog posts and getting more of a feel for a course or book that you could recommend to more proactively become a better writer. A specific book. There's so many books. The thing that frankly helped me was just when I was in business school, the, the class I took on business communication because it it helped fix what I learned in all of my previous English classes. <laughs> Through high school and early college, I was taught how to write essays. I was taught how to write research papers. Basically, write a thesis and prove the point. That's it. And then in college, I started learning as an engineer. I, took a, I had to take a technical writing class and then um, lab classes and stuff where we wrote up lab reports and wrote technical papers. Very different from a blog post. And so those were kind of my styles of writing. In business school, I took a business communications class. So it was not just writing, but we, we talked about emails. We talked about um, PowerPoints and stuff like that. But it completely changed the way that I approach communicating a, a point to somebody else, whether that's in an email or somewhere else. I learned how to write more concisely. I learned how to format my content in a way to accentuate things that I needed them to see because I know that like in an email, when you receive an email, if it's a long email with just a bunch of text and the paragraphs are really long, you're probably not going to read most of it. So having your paragraphs be shorter, you know, and where to break those for emphasis and where you can just bold or italicize some words or make a little section stand out by using M dashes at the beginning and end. Um, little things like that, that just accentuate certain things visually um, so that, People can scan it and still get the most out of what you're giving. Um, those principles helped me a lot. And so it was literally, it was just that class. Um, I'm trying to think of good books and we have several. So if you see a comment here, you, she's probably watching this right now. She likes, right, lately she's been getting a lot. There's, um, but Brandon Sanderson, who I mentioned in my video, amazing fiction writer, he he is a lecturer also at BYU in Utah, um, and he does like a class a year. But he literally has these lectures that he gives to this college class just available for free. So, Julie, if you're watching, um, if not, I'll find a link to that. But he has he talks a lot about kind of building story a lot about there's a lot of good stuff there too um it would be interesting and probably valuable to incorporate a little bit more of i've got to be careful with this but a little bit more of storytelling principles into our blogging without writing big long fluff stories that have nothing to do with the with the principle so writing our blog posts in a way that engages people throughout 
but I'm not talking about like writing a recipe blog post where people came for the recipe and you go off and off for like 5,000 words about your grandma. That That's not what we're talking about here. Um, I'll try to think of some other good ones and I'll put them in the description. Okay. Um, uh, let's see. What do you think? How much time is required to reach at least $500 a month through blogging alone? Not complimented by YouTube. Well, depends on what you mean by blogging alone. If by blogging alone, you mean I'm just going to write blog posts and I'm going to do nothing else, meaning no industry outreach, no participation anywhere. I'm not going to go join any Facebook groups in my niche to find out what questions other people have and to help them by answering their questions and, um, you know, occasionally where it's allowed <laughs> link to, or at least mention my content on the, on the web. Um, if you're not going to do literally anything else, but write blog posts, then to get to $500 a month, probably you're going to have to write a hundred articles or more, but again, just really depends. It also depends on how you're going to monetize it. If you're hoping to do that with just ads, I mean, it, it's getting harder to do. So, um, let's see. They're like, I'll give you cook for folks as an example. I think cook for folks does in ads a few hundred dollars a month, about 300 or so. Um, I haven't looked super recently, but the traffic's been fairly steady and the traffic's between 15 and 20,000 page views a month, I think. Um, and it's got a hundred plus articles on it. So, I mean, it's totally doable, but, um, and honestly, the content's not amazing <laughs> on Cook for Folks, if I'm going to be fair. Um, it, the traffic was about double where it's at uh, at one point before all, any of the helpful content started. Um, and then in that first year of helpful content, it dropped a bit, and then it's been steady ever since. So yeah, $500 is doable, but if we're saying only blogging, uh, that's, that's going to hold you back. Now, if you're willing to do a little bit of Pinterest. You know, you're not going to do YouTube, but you're willing to do some Pinterest. You're willing to do some other industry outreach. Then that's going to make it a much more sure thing. Um, Kip Bodner, HubSpot CMO, said that exponential SEO growth may no longer be achievable in about two or three years as it becomes more like other channels. Um, any idea for SEO reliant other than video? Um, I, I don't know. I don't. I don't really think about this as just... 100% SEO reliant. And that's why um, I think this, I, I'm just not seeing as big, like there's an, there's an issue right now for sure. The Google, the SERPs for many questions are not as helpful as they used to be. And a lot of the kind of content that bloggers have been creating is just not showing up. Now, some of it is, but a lot of it's not, a lot of it's just gone. Um, and so if, but so if that's the approach that we continue to take, then yeah, that's not going to work. But, um, and if we're talking about SEO reliant in terms of like traditional SEO, what most people are teaching and doing, what most professional SEOs do, which is literally to understand Google's algorithm and try to manipulate it, um, which is literally the opposite of what Google's telling you to do and what Google's been trying to get us to stop doing, um, now they're actively saying, create content for people, not for the algorithm. And with the advancements in AI, I honestly think the algorithm will get to a point where it, like, you won't really be able to game it very well at all um, because it, it'll it become less of an algorithm and more of a self-thinking <laughs> AI. Um, I mean, it already, it already is AI. It has been for a long time. But anyway, um, so I... I've never really focused on, in fact, we've never, ever, ever taught SEO growth. Our approach to SEO is writing content that should rank well. <laughs> um, and that still works. Now, reaching exponential growth within two to three years, we still see the hockey stick often happen in far less than that time frame. Um, I mean, even over the last year. So it's not that it's not possible, but things are changing. Um, and we're absolutely looking at all the different ways that we can build credibility. Um, the question here, lots of blogs disappeared. Do you think they will return? I think some will. I think as Google gets better at sorting between what's good and what's not. But if we want our blogs to return, 
I think we need to do more to establish their credibility. So some of those things we talked about, even just going in, creating a Google account for your business, like a normal free Google account, and then creating a Google business listing for your website. You don't have to have an address to do that. Like you don't have to put a pin on the map. One of the first questions Google asks you is, do you have an office or a store that people can walk into? And if you say no, fine. They don't ask you for an address and they don't put a pin on the map for you, but you can still fill out all of the other Google listing information and you can literally like add products to a Google store. And then all of your products can be in Google shopping. Um, so when somebody searches for that type of product and Google lists a bunch of different products, that's where those come from. It's the Google shopping directory. Get your products there, you know, do that kind of stuff. And that's going to add credibility. And then your business can start getting reviews from people. You can encourage readers of your blog to review um, you on Google. That's a little bit harder to do unless you have a product for them or some other way that you're engaging more directly. But, you know, the more you can do to get people to go review you on Google, that's going to help a lot too. Um, uh, Armando says, I've heard that Flipboard is the new hope for bloggers. Have you tried that platform? Nope, I have not yet. I've heard of it. I haven't really, I, I'm not one to just like chase after whatever's the hottest thing right now because the hottest thing changes so often that like nobody's ever on top of it. The people that like are on the forefront of a trend usually are lucky because they adopted something early that happened to become a trend. It's really hard to predict what's going to be the next trend um, before it happens. And so you can be an early adopter and hope that that thing picks up the way that you thought it would. And if so, there's often a lot of money to be made. I tend to kind of follow where things are going and make sure that I have something stable and steady. So if you want to go play around a flipboard, do it, but that doesn't mean like abandon your website or move all your content. Same thing. I'm not going to take all my content and go post it all on medium and delete it from my website. Um, I'm not going to do that kind of thing. But that doesn't mean don't go try out that platform or even like dive all in, but still keep your home base, keep your website and try to get people back there because that's where you have the best opportunity to influence them and to make a good income from them. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Marcus says, it looks like Google's losing market share in some markets, especially in some European markets. Bing is increasing a lot, still a small player though, which is, I think, a good thing. I would love to see better competition. I know Bing's been working hard. They've, they, there's so many TV shows where like when the characters do a search on the internet, they're like, let's go Bing this. And then they shows like Bing on the screen while they're typing it in. Um, and you're like, okay, nobody says that. It's not a thing. I am totally fine with there being other competitors. I think the existence of DuckDuckGo, it serves a different, uh, another purpose for people. Um, and all sorts of, I mean, there's other, um, there's the Brave browser and they have, I, I guess, um, I think their own search engine built into that. I'm not, I can't remember. I have only used it a couple of times, but they, they provide certain specific use cases. And honestly, if Google is not giving you the search results you want, use a different search engine. And I think if we did that more, Google would probably do a better job of making sure that they meet our needs and our wants. And right now, the content that's been ranking well on Google, all of our blogs still tend to be doing really well on Bing, which is great. So I'm all about it. Like, let's see some good competition from Bing. Um, interesting thing that I heard, um, I think it was in our... Project 24 community. Um, last night I read this in a thread, but like a recent study showed that um, young people today, kids, teenagers, uh, young adults, they say, I don't go to Google for anything. I go to Reddit, I go to YouTube, I go to TikTok, I go to here, I go to there. Um, but as we discussed it, we realized like, they don't even realize they're using Google though. So they'll open up a browser, most often it's Chrome. <laughs> and then they'll just type a question in the address bar and then they'll get their answer from Reddit or from YouTube or wherever else. But how did they find it in the first place? It was Google. And so it's like people, like young people today, especially, they don't even, they don't even know what tool they're using. 
but they're still using Google. And I think it's because, especially since Google gave us their own browser and made it nice, I still prefer Chrome over um, whatever Microsoft Edge or whatever it is. I prefer Chrome. Um, I like it as a browser better. They've given us lots of good tools. So they've just kind of built this whole ecosystem, just like Apple has. I've got all these Apple products um, and it, it makes it so convenient for me. So now you're in this Google ecosystem and you're just using the search engine just because like, it's just what you do uh, without even thinking about it. And um, I think that's part of the reason they've solidified their market share, even though their search engine isn't necessarily better. So we might be stuck there unless we can all change our behavior. Um, Vlad, greetings. Um, let's see. Yeah, thank you for being here, by the way. I, I, I do, I really appreciate, by the way, um, many of you are very kind and, um, and very supportive. And so it, it does mean a lot. It, it can be really tough as content creators. You, you'll probably experience this yourself. It can be really tough to put in a lot of work and not get much feedback at all. Blogging has gotten really hard because very rarely do we even get comments unless somebody's upset about something you said. Um, on YouTube, we get comments, but like right now, niche websites aren't working very well. So most of the comments on my videos are people who are just upset. Um, and then I and then I get these really kind comments, and those ones like get downvoted by people <laughs> um, and barely show up. But they mean a lot. So thank you, by the way, for for being kind and understanding. I don't have a crystal ball. I didn't know exactly what was gonna happen. I published a video a few weeks ago uh, saying I was excited for this update because what Google said their intentions were. I'm not seeing their intentions being anywhere near what the result has been. And so last week's video, I was kind of calling them out. I wanna point something out by the way. In my video last week, I said, for to be a successful blog content creator going forward, um, you're going to have to be willing to work hard. You can't be lazy. You're going to have to be willing to have something of value to add to the internet. We've talked about that a bit today. And you need to have a realistic expectation. This isn't a, a get rich quick, make a bunch of money overnight. It's totally passive kind of thing. Um, it used to be more like that. It's not anymore. It hasn't really been for a while, but it's getting far or less that way. Never at any time did I say that if you lost traffic, it's because you were lazy. Not what I said. There were many people who were angry at me in the comments for calling them lazy. It's not what I said. Now, if going forward, you want to take a lazy approach to blogging, which a lot of people do, what I said was, that's not going to work. It's not the same thing. So um, just wanted to point that out. I, I never... Well, I won't say never because I'm human and imperfect, but I try very hard to not cast judgment about people, especially when I don't really even know the details of their situation. But even when I feel like I do know some details, I've learned that I rarely know nearly enough details to be able to cast any sort of fair judgment. And so I try not to have that be part of my life. Um, so I'm not calling any of you lazy. If you lost traffic, you're just like the rest of us. I have sites that lost traffic. Some of it's because some of my content was kind of lazy content, but a lot of it's just because what we've built so far doesn't isn't quite matching what Google wants going forward. They want us to, I think they do want us to build more of a brand and build more credibility around that brand to validate that we are um, legitimate going forward. Um, and if we haven't been doing that because that wasn't necessary not very long ago, then we lost traffic. It could be that simple. So if you feel like I called you lazy, I'm sorry, that was not my intention. But I was trying to be deliberately a little bit bold in what I said, because frankly on YouTube that does better. Um, I make all these videos, I make all these videos trying to like provide really helpful things. Like I made a video about here's how to take good pictures of products. If you're gonna make a affiliate blog posts, like have a good picture of a product. And yes, I showed a setup that was probably different from what any of you have or what most of you have, but I focused on trying to teach good principles of good lighting and stuff. So you can start with a good photo. And then I don't care if you use AI and stuff to help make it even better. But if you start with a good photo with decent lighting, it's going to be better. 
most of you probably didn't watch that video. I made a video over a year ago about branding. Also one of my lower viewed videos over a year ago. And I'm being accused of today telling people, all you got to do is write a few blog posts a week and uh, that'll be successful. It's never been what we taught. So um, I, I just, it's, it's hard for me when like I try to create content that's super helpful, but it's just not what people wanted. So they don't watch it, even though it's what they need. I don't blame you for that. That's human nature. And so if occasionally in a video, I'm a little extra bold or the title or the thumbnail of the video seems to be like intentionally eye-catching, that's why. It's because that's what it takes to succeed on that platform. The only way to get you to watch what you need to watch is for me to convince you that you want to watch it first. Just something to keep in mind, especially if you're going to do YouTube. But I think the same applies. The same can apply to blogging. In fact, it absolutely does. Because all of us, almost every single blogger, when we start, I did the same thing. When we first start, we write a bunch of blog posts that are the things that we feel like people need and they're the things we want to get off our chest and whatever. And I've taught this many times, like, don't just write all the stuff you feel like writing because it's your opinion, but also don't just write the things that you feel like people need to hear if it's not something that they know to ask. If nobody's asking that question, it's never going to show up in a Google search. Now, that's changed a little bit today because you probably, if people need to know it, you probably should still write about it because it builds topical authority and you can link from your other blog post to that blog post. Because in your other blog posts where you write about the things that they knew to ask, you can then steer them and direct them and say, this is something else you need to know, and then guide them toward that other blog post. But for the most part, if you're wanting something to get eyeballs and get people to click on it, you not you need to focus on writing what people know to ask and what they want um, and use that content to steer them toward what they actually need. Um, all right, here we go. I'm going to take some more questions. I know we're already... Um, at an hour, but I'm going to take a few more because there are a bunch more. Uh, one here from Geeky Gorovan. Um, Do you think having a Google listing for a completely online business would be beneficial even if you don't have a physical location? Would that help with authority? Yes, 100%. Um, and you said set it as a home address. You don't need to set an address. Uh, you used to have to. Um, I, in fact, it was a few months ago I was setting up a Google listing for um, literally I was doing it for a course video and, um, I saw that one of the first questions it asked me was, do you have an office? And I could answer yes, cause I do. Um, and it doesn't have to be my house, which is nice. I don't really want people coming to my house thinking that that's where they're going to reach my business. <laughs> I'd really rather they didn't. Um, so I don't want to list my home address really in Google as my address. You don't have to do that. You can just create a Google listing. Now, um, you can say that you have a mailing address and set it as a P.O. box or something, uh, which I think is better than having no address for your business. Uh, but you don't have to have a physical location to create a Google business account, a Google business listing. Um, and that allows you to create and sell products and receive reviews and all that kind of stuff for your business, even if you don't have a physical location. I think it's smart that Google finally figured out that like, oh yeah, some businesses are just online. Maybe we should create a way for them to have a Google business listing, even if they don't have an address. Pretty nice of them. Um, took them long enough. <laughs> um, how important is it to have the same brand name on social media and the blog? And if the same name is important and the blog brand is not suitable for social media, should you rename the established blog? I think it's beneficial if you can be consistent. So um, on a project I've been working on, uh, we did this. And social media accounts are pretty easy to rename. Blog's a little harder if you're trying to rename the domain. Um, you can sort of name your blog something, even if the URL for the blog doesn't perfectly match it, um, because you can just name your blog something that's just a WordPress setting and then have a URL. Um, what you might do is to start out with, you could purchase the domain of what you want your brand to be across all platforms. And you could start by just redirecting that domain to your existing blog. And that way, if people type that in, because that's how they know you on social, or um, if you link to that, it'll just redirect. Um, and then over time, like later on, or I mean, you could do this now even, you could migrate all the content to the new site, create a full on redirect, um, a wildcard redirect. So basically, as long as you keep the same structure for all your permalinks, uh, so 
you know, if your permalink structure is like um, your main URL slash and then the name of your blog post, and that's your structure. If you keep that same structure when you move it to the new domain, um, then you can just create one wildcard redirect that will automatically take anything and just replace that first section of the URL. And then um, make sure that you're set up with both domains in Google Search Console and alert them that you changed, it's a change of address. So just search in Google Search Console for change of address and alert Google that, yeah, I just changed the name of my blog. I, unless the new brand name seems way off brand for the topic, I've never had that not work and maintain its level of traffic. So, but I would, I would work on consistency of branding uh, because I just think that that credibility is going to be vital going forward. Um, all right, let's see. Oh, yep. There's Julie. She did comment with, um, a few books. <laughs> uh, some of them, like this one here, a manual for writers of research papers, theses, and dissertations. That's probably not going to help you as much as a blogger, but um, but there's uh, there's other ones that we've got that I think are pretty good. Genghis Khan asked, "Is this live?" Yes. All right. Um, I probably. I could answer questions all day long, but I actually have to go record a podcast. So um, I think we'll call it today. Thank you all for, for being here. Thank you all for participating, for, um, for your support. We're going we're gonna to figure things out. And if there's a final message I could leave you with, it's two things. I can never have just one final message. Two things. The first one, don't think of yourself as a blogger or a niche site creator. You are a business owner. I know I mentioned that earlier in the live. Treat it as a business and think of it that way. Act credible <laughs> and, and you will be. Um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Um, what was the other thing? There was a second thing. Um, darn it. I'll probably have to just make a YouTube video about it here soon. <laughs> there, was, there was another thing. But that's probably... One of the biggest things, though, that I, I would recommend is, is just don't don't limit yourself by saying, well, I, I make niche sites or I, I'm a blogger. I make blog posts. Think of yourself as a business that does something to improve people's lives. Figure out what that something can be. You don't have to figure that out right away. Your business right now can just be content. But be thinking about that and be working toward that. And try to actually improve people's lives. The people that come to you, if you have something of value for them, people will come. And um, that leads to the second thing. And the second thing was just because things aren't doing great today based on what we've done in the past, like the blogging we've done has led to a decrease in traffic today. That doesn't mean that what we've done is dead or useless. It means that today, Something that we did in the past doesn't work or isn't working right now. Things are going to change again here very soon. Um, whether or not it'll improve for us, probably a lot of that depends on us. I think that Google will be able to see pretty quickly which of the blog type websites did the things that they told them to <laughs> and started building more credibility and all that kind of stuff, and which ones continued just being full of spam content. And so if we just leave our blogs and do nothing, I think we're gonna stay where we're at. But if we make these efforts, I think that as new core updates come out, we're gonna be the ones that rise to the top. So don't think of anything that's happened right now as the final, it's not final. Um, it's This is one step on the journey, just like the stock market goes through recessions. Everybody that pulls out because it's a, it's a recession and says, see, the stock market doesn't work. They lose money. Meanwhile, other people are taking what they have and buying stocks because they're on sale. And then three years later, they made a boatload of money because the market came back. I think that we're in a bit of a dip right now as content creators because of what Google's doing. And I think if we just do the right things, 
our businesses can be very successful. We just probably can't just keep doing things exactly the way we were. All right. That was my second thing. Um, thank you all again for being here. Uh, I hope to see you all again soon.